Super Mario 64 is one of the most important games ever made. It introduced the joystick to thousands of players. It was Mario's first main adventure in 3D. It featured a camera system that was revolutionary at that time. And it was a blast to play back in 1996. Since then, gaming has changed a lot. Technology has advanced at a mind-boggling pace. New and better ways to implement 3D spaces or cameras were found. And level and game design evolved as the discipline grew older. But what happened to Mario 64 during this time? Did the game manage to grow old gracefully or does this once revolutionary game fall apart when looked at more than 21 years after its initial release? In this video, I want to revisit all these magical worlds of my childhood and I want to find out how good Super Mario 64 stands the test of time. So you ready? Let's find out! So the first clever thing Mario 64 does happens before we even start the save file. It gives us a huge Mario face and we are able to grab parts of Mario's beautiful face like his nose or his mustache and to tear them until his face becomes glitchy. This is not only in the game because Nintendo wanted to demonstrate the unbelievable power of their new console by showing it could render 3D objects in real time or because it is fun to do so. But this is also a small training ground for people on how to use the joystick. It is a toy, something which is fun to interact with that doesn't follow any rule set that can be controlled by the joystick. The Nintendo 64 was the first console that utilized the joystick and Mario 64 was a Nintendo 64 release title. This means that for tons of different players around the globe, including myself, this game was the first one they played that featured a joystick. If you only controlled games with four directional buttons so far, having a joystick in your hand feels pretty alien at first. This screen here helps players to get accustomed to the new control scheme. The same is true for the castle area before the first level. Those two areas are really cool and interesting ways to make players comfortable with the new control scheme and they both work without any lengthy tutorials. They trust the player to be curious how the controls work in case he or she is unfamiliar with them and then they offer a space to practice in case it is needed. In my opinion this is the ideal way to handle a tutorial of any kind whenever possible. The story of Super Mario 64 is incredibly simple. Mario is invited to Peach's castle to eat a cake because that's what dates used to be back in the old days. But when he arrives, he discovers that not only Princess Peach was kidnapped once again, but that there is no cake either. The only way to save the princess and the delicious cake is to collect power stars in order to beat Bowser. And that's it. I think this story does what it is supposed to do. The intro is kept as short as possible and doesn't act as an unnecessary and time consuming barrier between the start and the gameplay, but still tries to give Mario at least some sort of reason to jump into all these paintings and to collect power stars. This may seem like a small thing, but if you've ever replayed the game with seemingly never ending and completely pointless unskippable intro cutscenes, you'll appreciate the difference. The first stage Mario is forced to enter is Bob on Battlefield. This star is the only predefined star in the entire game. Once the first star has been collected, the order in which stars are collected depends entirely on the player. Mario 64 is surprisingly open in this regard. And the further we progress into the game, the more it opens up. Bob on Battlefield is the first stage. And this one is actually one of my favorites. The stage is structured as a wide open field with a hill in its center. There aren't many real threats in this stage, which makes it a really cool playground to jump and run around for Mario. The stars in the stage are fairly straightforward, but one of them is really interesting. One of the stars is intended to be collected once Mario unlocked the flight cap. The flight cap can't be obtained if a player only played Bob on Battlefield so far. I think this star proves that the team wanted to make players switch between different stages and not to have players work through all the seven stars in one sitting, like if it was a checklist and then move on. They basically force players to explore the castle and to find Wump's fortress sooner or later. Interestingly, Wump's fortress can be completed in one sitting and there is no star that requires an additional cap in this stage. This stage is brilliant in general. The level is laid out like a rising spiral, but there are tons of different ways where different corners can be cut and different paths to a higher layer of the spiral can be taken. This makes exploring and moving around in this level incredibly enjoyable. There are still not many threats in this stage, but the first platforming challenges appear here, with the tower on top of the castle and the rotating platforms. One of the strangest stars in the game is hidden in this stage. That blast away the wall star. This star is hidden behind this wall piece and there is no real clue in the level that you're supposed to shoot yourself at this exact spot. So how is anyone supposed to find this star? 
Well, the game has a hidden where to find the star hint system built into it that many people may not even realize. The names of the stars at the mission selection screen. These names give fairly explicit hints at the hidden secrets of the levels. The blast away the wall star is always here. It is possible to collect it way earlier, but I highly doubt that many players found this star before they got the hint of its name. That's a really clever and subtle system to hint at the game's many secrets. Mario 64 is extremely brave when it comes to hide important content from the player. If you solve a mystery in this game, like blasting away this wall, it really really feels like you were able to solve a huge mystery of the game yourself. The game is very explicit in giving Mario an idea what to do in the description of the stars and really good at hinting towards secrets. The star World from the Freezing Pond for example is an exact description of what Mario needs to do in order to find a secret. There are even entire levels hidden. I always wondered why the team decided to numerate the stages. To me all the stages in one area of the castle felt as if they were meant to be one equal sets of levels. I never considered Big Boo's mansion to be level 5 and Dire Dire Dogs to be level 9. To me, they felt like equal stages in the second set of levels in the game. I just realized during my current playthrough what a possible reason for this could be. If we hit the start button in the hub world, we can see a list of all the levels we visited and these are numerated. So if we see level 6, 7 and then level number 9, then this is the game's way of telling you that there is a hidden stage in the basement you haven't found yet. Shifting Sandlands, in this case. That's something small, but I imagine if you were developing the game and decide to hide levels from the player as secrets, you don't want the players to not find the levels. You want to give them the feeling that it is really easy to miss a secret level and that it did something cool by finding the stage, but you don't want to actually hide the level from most of your players because that would be a horrific use of development resources. I'm actually quite certain that this is the reason why they decided to numerate the stages, but I could be wrong about this. Anyway, the next stage, which our cakes are searching plumber has to explore is Jolly Roger Bay and I think the best I have to say about this stage is that it's not the worst one in the game. The stage is basically a huge hole in the ground that is filled with water. There is one path diverging from the stage which leads into a small cave and that's the stage. Most parts of this area are simply swimming in this open area. I actually like the swimming mechanics here and I think they're well done but they just feel out of place once a whole level is only about swimming. The team decided to build two levels completely around swimming and almost nothing else but only build one and a half level that combines swimming and normal jumping gameplay. So this game was made a long time ago and it is really hard to judge the team for such a decision because I can only imagine what insane technical limitations they had to work with but Wet Dry World kind of proves that it was possible for them to build levels filled half with water and half with standard platforming and I think having more of such stages would have been more interesting than having the same waterhole stage twice in the same game. Luckily the next stage is one of my favorites. Cool Cool Mountain is a frozen glacier stage with a twist. Instead of the objective being to start at the bottom of the mountain, like Bob on Battlefield does in a way, the objective here is to make the way down. This stage also features a lot of slopes. The slope sliding mechanics in this game are amazing. I love how Mario controls when sliding in his overalls and at least one of the stars that require Mario to slide down the main slope here is really really challenging. There is something really small and subtle they do at the start of the slope. When Mario starts to slide, this shiny blue coin in front of Mario suddenly starts to move. This coin is worth as much as 5 normal coins or 3 red coins minus 1 coin. There is no way our plumber doesn't want to grab this wonderful coin. So here's the thing, Mario isn't fast enough to reach this amazing reward which he objectively absolutely desires to pick up. So what is the reflex of the player controlling Mario who probably sympathizes with Mario and really wants our favorite plumber to grab the coin? Well it is to push the joystick forward in order to grab the coin. This makes Mario slide faster but then there is a curve and if Mario keeps the speed he just built up he will drop into his doom. So the next reflex is to pull the joystick back in order to slow down and thanks to game magic this makes Mario actually slow down. This setup explains the sliding controls without the need of a tutorial. Almost every player will push forward when he or she sees the coin and pull back when Mario almost drops down. This teaches the sliding mechanics without the need of a tutorial. It's such an inconspicuous and elegant solution to communicate this to a player. Words can't express how much I like this blue coin. Cool Cool Mountain is the last of the four beginner levels and the next area Mario has to explore is the first Bowser stage. 
I really like the Bowser stages. And this is interesting, because this stands in complete opposition with something I want to talk about in a moment. The Bowser levels are straightforward platforming levels, and their design is probably best compared to the design of Super Mario Galaxy. They are linear paths which feature different obstacles along the way and a boss fight at the end. The platforming in Mario 64, in my opinion, never feels better than it does in these stages. The main levels are usually more open spaces and have a focus on exploration and small challenges built into them, with the exception of the last two levels, but we'll talk about them once we get there. First, Mario needs to explore the basement levels. The next stage Mario has to explore is Big Boo's Mansion. I love the concept of this level. It's basically a wide open space. In its center is a mansion, with a basement, a foyer, a first floor and an attic. The layout of this stage mimics the layout of the Mushroom Castle and feels like a really weird, haunted version of the nice hub world we explored so far. Exploring this stage is always a highlight for me when playing the game. This may be a good moment to talk about the 100 coin stars and coins in general. Every stage features a 7th star objective for collecting 100 coins in a level. This star is special since it allows Mario to stay in the level once he collected it. The 100 coin stars are my favorite stars in the game. They offer a great excuse to just run around the stage and to explore every corner of it and exploring is probably the most enjoyable part of Mario 64. Combined with how agile and fast Mario is and how easy it is to get anywhere in this game makes just running around and collecting 100 coins one of the most joyful experiences in the game for me. Later in the game the 100 coin stars are actually some of the most challenging stars in the game since most parts of a level need to be visited in order to get it and visiting most parts of the stage becomes really challenging in the later levels. And apart from the 100 coin star the coins in themselves are a really important part of the game. Having shiny coins laying around every corner of the stage allows the developers to reward every player with something around every corner. And I usually run a little bit out of my way to collect a bunch of coins even if I don't plan to get the 100 coin star. There is something about the coins that I quickly want to point out. Their hitboxes. Mario picks the coins up long before he actually touches them. This makes it really easy to collect them. It's almost impossible to miss a coin by accident. That's one of the oldest design tricks. Giving things the player is supposed to like bigger hitboxes helps to make collecting them feel really rewarding. And in my opinion, that's something every game should do. I remember that I started to really dislike collecting the feathers in ukulele because it is so ridiculously easy to miss them. I really like ukulele, but that is something they really messed up in my opinion. The one-up mushroom in Mario. 64 suffers from the same problem. It is really easy to miss and makes collecting them a little bit frustrating. It really amazes me why the coins have this huge generous hitbox in Mario 64 while the mushrooms are hard to grab. Anyway, since we're talking about hitboxes, I really dislike Mario's hitbox in Mario 64. As soon as Mario is only a toe over the edge of a platform, he drops down. Modern platformers usually give the player a bigger hitbox than he should have, because this really helps to make the game feel fair. But in Mario 64, Mario immediately falls down, which leads to a couple of problems, especially since the game features many really small platforms. But more on this in a second. Tweaking with hitboxes in the favor of a player by enlarging the player's collision masks so that platforming and collecting good stuff becomes easier or shrinking the enemy's hitboxes so that the player has a little bit more margin of error before getting hit actually has a long tradition in Mario games. The first game I know about that ever used this trick was the original Super Mario Bros where the whole game was basically manipulated into the player's favor. I have no idea why they only partly continued with this in Super Mario 64. Hazy Maze Cave is the next area our brave plumber has to explore in order to finally rescue Princess Peach, which represents Mario's only realistic way to to ever get his hands on a cake. The stage is laid out as a labyrinth and it is really easy to get lost in here during your first playthrough, or at least it was really easy for me as a kid. This may be a good moment to talk about the brilliance of Mario's movement in this game. The movement is brilliant. It is ridiculous what Nintendo was able to accomplish here, especially considering that 64 was one of the first 3D games. In fact, the movement is so great that I'd say that there are only a handful of platformers until today that feature better movement than Mario 64. And two of these games are Mario games. The whole movement is designed for Mario to throw himself around in wide arcs and the focus is more on horizontal than vertical movement. For example the long jump gives you an insane horizontal boost, but also no height. The same is true for the wall jump. The triple jump gives our plumber a lot of height but needs a lot of horizontal space in order to get pulled off and to do the side flip Mario has to run into a horizontal direction in order to get height. All these moves are designed for wide horizontal spaces and the in-air control Mario keeps when using his special moves is awesome and feels great to use. I love just to run around in the courtyard of the castle and to jump and throw myself through this wide open area. Because controlling Mario in 64 isn't just a method of getting from A to B, but a really creative and fun to use process. The game actually allows for a couple of intended 
and unintended sequence breaks for people who mastered Mario's movement. I don't think that there is any way they weren't aware that this star for example can be grabbed by triple jump into wall kick, but it is really cool that they decided to leave it in nonetheless. Lethal Lava Land is Mario's next stop on his journey through all the amazing paintings in Peach's castle. In this level there is a star that is really representative of how the team handles the stars and the rise in difficulty in Mario 64, the 8 red coin star. The 8 red coins in this level are all in one place on top of this shifting Bowser puzzle. This star is basically rewarded for surviving long enough on top of the puzzle so that Mario is able to collect all 8 red coins and then the star spawns immediately besides Mario. I'd like to call such a challenge a micro challenge. Almost all of the stars in the game are handed out for solving a micro challenge. A couple of examples. Throwing this bully into the lava is a micro challenge and the star is rewarded. Figuring out the order of these four stupid chests is a micro challenge. Surviving the slide to the bottom of the slide is one and winning the race against the penguin another one. Entering this area with the metal cap is one and as a last example solving the puzzle to shoot Mario's poor head against this wall is another one. So what is interesting about this? Well the game almost never requires Mario to solve more than a single micro challenge in order to get one star, even though this would be a great way to increase the difficulty. Basically there could be an objective like finding a secret entrance, in this room solve a puzzle and then make your way over a difficult platforming section in order to get a star. This would be a set of three micro challenges that are tied together and this could serve as a blueprint to increase how difficult getting a star in the game is. Following this logic the basic structure would be as follows. The early game stars would only require Mario to survive one of these micro challenges, while the latest stages would feature sets of three or four challenges in order to get a single star. But that is not the way the game increases its difficulty. Instead it makes the path to these micro challenges more dangerous. Navigating the first couple of levels is super easy and there aren't many threats for Mario, so he's free to run around and to find the challenges that in return reward him with a star. Later levels make navigation more dangerous by having dangerous floor like lava or poison or quicksand and it becomes harder to reach the areas where the challenge for the next star awaits Mario. The challenges to become a little harder the further we progress through the game, but there is almost always only one single objective tied to one single star. The rising difficulty is a result of the levels containing these micro challenges becoming more difficult, not the micro challenges themselves, which is a really interesting way of handling difficulty in my opinion. The next stage is shifting sandlands. This stage's layout follows the same formula as Steve Lava Land. There is a wide open area with a significant point of interest in its center. In this level it is the pyramid. The pyramid is one of the areas where Mario 64 is biggest three problems really come into play. The camera, replaying content and precision platforming. Ok, so the camera first. Super Mario 64 revolutionized the way cameras work in 3D spaces. Up until this game there basically was no real working method to implement third person cameras in games. Cameras were either static or glued onto the back of the character up to this point. But then Mario 64 came along and nailed this. Almost all modern third person games from Dark Souls to Zelda to Splatoon used the same basic concept of a camera which Mario 64 first brought onto the table. While the camera was probably the most important thing Mario 64 revolutionized for gaming, it is sadly the part of the game that aged the least gracefully. I don't want to talk about the camera too much for two reasons. Firstly, everyone who plays Mario 64 for 10 minutes today notices these problems immediately and secondly there really isn't a point in pointing out how bad the camera is by today's standards because they simply weren't able to implement it in a better way at the time and we should be happy that they tried because otherwise we wouldn't be where we are now. You could consider it as something like the mother of all 3D cameras and I really don't want to criticize mother camera. I want to talk about something else concerning the camera instead. How the design of the game sometimes plays directly into its weak spots instead of its strengths. The camera works ok for the most part of the game, even by today's standard, but its weaknesses really are apparent when there are a lot of walls and obstacles for it to become caught in. The wider the area the less problems the camera has, but the closer and more cramped the environment is, the more often the camera carrying the key to decides to take really creative and artistic shots of Mario that sadly are completely useless when trying to play the game. The pyramid is one of these areas where the camera really fails to do its job. The second problem is replaying areas. There are two stars hidden in the pyramid that basically have the exact same objective twice. One is to platform to the top in order to collect the star, the other one is to visit a couple of secret places inside the pyramid and one of these secret places is directly below the star from before. So the challenge to reach the top of the pyramid basically needs to be completed twice in a row. So for the pyramid 
this isn't a big deal and the reason why such objectives are in the game is once again because of the insane technical limitations the team had to deal with when designing the game. But this becomes a really big problem in one of the later levels. The third problem is precision platforming. So I talked before about how brilliant I consider the movement in Mario 64 to be and I stand by this, but the movement is built to navigate Mario through wide horizontal planes, not to do precise platforming. And whenever precision is required, Mario starts to do weird things, but not what we want him to do. So let's talk about Mario's turn radius. When Mario looks in one direction and stands still and we input to turn around, Mario turns around immediately. When Mario runs at full speed into one direction and we input to turn around, he first slips a little bit into the direction he ran and then he turns around immediately. So far, so good. But if Mario moves into one direction at any speed that is not max speed or standing still and we input to turn around, then Mario does something really weird. Instead of turning around, he walks a huge circle before he finally looks into the direction we wanted him to look at. So when do we want to turn around while not running at full speed? Bingo, when precision is needed. But when precision is needed, Mario simply doesn't turn around, but he walks in a gigantic half circle. Often he simply walks off the platform he's currently standing on. That is one of the biggest problems of the game. While Mario's movement feels incredibly responsive when going fast, it feels really awkward to the same extent when trying to move precise. Mario's movement needs a lot of space in order to feel great, but the space is often very limited during platforming sections. Combined with the camera that likes to get stuck in walls, it is the reason why I'm not too fond of the pyramid area, even though I love it in theory. So should they have implemented a smaller turn radius? Well, a little bit smaller probably wouldn't have hurt, but I actually like the turn radius a lot when navigating wide open spaces. It makes Mario feel like a real plumber that moves around all these amazing and dangerous places and not like a video game avatar. I think they should have gone for another solution. I'll come back to this at the end of the video. But first we need to discuss a couple more things. The next stage is Dire Dire Docks and the best thing I can say about this stage is that it's Jolly Roger Bay again. There really isn't much going on here. It's once again the same concept that we already saw in Jolly Roger's Bay. A waterhole and a ship. The stage features my least favorite star in the entire game. The four douchebag chests at the bottom of the ocean. So there are these four chests down here. Mario needs to open them in the right order. The only way to find out what the right order is, is by trial and error. Swimming towards these chests has to be really precise and takes forever. So basically we have to swim around here and trial and error until we are able to open all the chests that would be bad enough. But in the middle of the chests is this instant death whirlwind that tries to soak Mario into it. And if it does we have to try all of that once again. That's not so much fun. The 100 coin star here suffers from a problem too, the low draw distance of coins. So they have to limit the amount of things they draw at once because otherwise the frame rate really tanks and this stage is one of the areas with the most lag. Probably because of this they had to reduce the draw distance of coins to a really really small area. And coins only just start to become drawn once Mario is really close. Since the entire stage is really open it often appears that there are no coins in a specific area even when there are. Finding the 100 coins in this level took me forever, mainly because I checked this area for coins but didn't get close enough to see that there are coins. Because of this I ended up swimming up and down everywhere looking for the last coins but not in the area where they actually were hiding. Dire Dire Docks is probably one of the more forgettable stages in Mario 64. But luckily there are 15 and most of them are brilliant. Collecting the first star in Dire Dire Docks gives Mario access to the second Bowser stage. This stage is once again a linear precision platforming gauntlet and once again I really love this stage and consider it to be one of the best parts of the game, even though I just talked that the game isn't built for platforming. I'll try to solve this contradiction at the end of the video. Beating Bowser the second time grants Mario access to the first floor of the castle and to the third set of levels. The first stage here is the best hidden one in the game, Snowman's Land. In order to enter this painting our plumber needs to carefully observe this mirror, because the painting that contains the entrance to Snowman's Land is only visible in the mirror. This stage is probably the easiest one to miss. This painting is a good moment to talk about the enemy design in this game. In general the enemies aren't very dangerous in Mario 64 and whenever I lost a life it was because of a lethal lava buff or a drop into a hole without a bottom but an enemy was rarely able to beat me in my ultimate form as Mario. The most dangerous enemies are probably the small black dots that spit fire but they are mainly dangerous because Mario tends to throw himself off a cliff while burning and not because their attacks are so dangerous themselves. 
lot of enemies feel like they're mainly in the game because a Mario game wouldn't feel like Mario without Goombas and bob -ombs. Other enemies were clearly designed to show off the features of the new joystick, like the sleeping piranha plants that need to be approached silently, or the eye and snowman enemies that decide to give up on the game if Mario runs circles around them. But there is also another type of enemies which I personally find really interesting. Enemies that are a threat to Mario while also offering him a helping hand at the same time. The spin drifts in Snowman's Land are a great example for this. If Mario jumps onto their head and therefore defeats them, he gains a lot of additional height and does a really cool spin jump. This means that these enemies are actually helping Mario to do his platforming, while also being a threat. Other examples for enemies that work in such a way are the Koopas, which drop their really useful shell when defeated, and the heavy hose that always threaten to throw Mario off the platform he's currently on, but which can also be used to reach otherwise unreachable places by getting thrown towards them. And then there are the Grindles, Pushy Walls and Worms, which act as dangerous platforms for Mario. Designing enemies in a way that they are a threat and helpful at the same time is always pretty clever, and there are a couple of enemies in Mario 64 that were clearly designed to be an obstacle and to help Mario overcome obstacles at the same time. Jumping off of the spin rifts in Snowman's Land is actually required in order to get two stars. Next up is Wet Dry World, one of the most interesting levels in Mario 64 and a good place to discuss one of the things I see people mention the most when Mario 64 is discussed. The fact that the game throws Mario out of the stage after each collected star, except for the 100 coin one. This is one of the things the game does which people probably like the least about the game. And I have to admit it's really annoying in parts, especially when doing the 100 coin star, because collecting 100 coins often requires Mario to basically do a couple of objectives that reward the star in one sitting. In Wet Dry World there is a red coin star, a star where Mario has to visit 5 secret places, a lot of them reward coins, and a star that is rewarded for exploring the top of the stage. The thing is, all of this basically has to be done when collecting the 100 coin star. I often deliberately avoided collecting a star in a stage when I was there, simply because I was collecting 100 coins and if I picked it up, I had to start all over again. That's definitely not ideal. Yet I still want to defend the game for throwing Mario out of painting so often for three reasons. First, the level layout is sometimes altered when a new mission starts. The best example is the tower in Wump's Fortress. This tower only spawns once the Wump King is defeated and it probably simply wasn't possible to do this on the fly due to technical limitations. There are tons of examples for such things in the game. Cooper the Quick only appears during the second mission. The ship starts to float after the first star is collected in Jolly Roger Bay and the ship in Dire Dire Docks disappears completely. Doing these things without throwing Mario out of the stage probably was impossible for them at the time and so the question is, is it worth it to throw Mario out of a level in order to get these things into the game? And in my opinion the answer is yes. The other thing throwing Mario out of a stage does is it really helps with the pacing of the game. The levels in Super Mario 64 are small tiny actually. They are built in a way that it is fun to explore them and to replay certain objectives a couple of times. Wom's Fortress is a good example for this. The stage is set up in a way that it is fun to reach the top. There are different paths upwards that provide different challenges and there are shortcuts which allow you to get up there more easily once you get to know the stage better. If they wouldn't force the player to leave the stage, the level would become linear in parts. Defeat Womp King, turn around and climb the tower, jump onto the floating platforms to collect the red coins there and that would be all most half of the content of the stage. There are other stages where this is even more apparent. Tall Tall Mountain is a good example as well. The levels are built to be explored from the same starting point over and over again and not to slowly make your way deeper into the stage. But there is another argument for throwing Mario out of the stage. TikTok Clock, Tiny Huge Island and Wet Dry World. These three levels all can be manipulated by the way our plumber enters them. Wet Dry World actually has two stars that can only be collected by entering the level in a specific way because entering the painting at its highest point sets the initial water level higher than it can be manipulated in the starting area, which opens up the path to an otherwise inaccessible area. In TikTok Clock the time can be famously stopped. These are two things about Mario 64 which I love. Wet Dry World and TikTok Clock always come to my mind first when thinking about the game, simply because it was so creative how the levels were manipulated by the way they were entered. And if Mario wasn't thrown out of the stages, this simply wouldn't work in such a clean way. 
there are probably some ways to still have these features in the game in another way. But that's kind of my point. Would it be possible to change the level layout of the game so that stars aren't too close together? Sure, would it be possible to give Wet Dry World and TikTok Clock some other form of time stop manipulation and water level changer than the way Mario enters them? Absolutely. Would it be possible to change the way the level layout changes in a way that Mario is allowed to stay in the game? Well, probably, but the point is, if all of this is done, then Mario 64 is a wildly different game than it is currently. Would this game be better? Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't, I have no idea. But I'm quite certain that simply leaving Mario in the stages as they are now after collecting a star and changing nothing else about the game would do the game no favor. While leaving the stage is really a little bit alienating, I love the game as it is now. And changing this mechanic would mean to mess around with a lot of things that define Mario 64 to me. And since I love the game as it is, I'm willing to give the team here the benefit of doubt. And I think it was the right decision to design the game in a way that Mario always re-enters the stage at the same starting point. Anyway, the next level Mario has to explore is Tall Tall Mountain and this stage may be a good point to talk about the technical limitations the team had to face when they developed the game. So I often see Mario 64 compared with Banjo Kazooie when talking about the best platformers of the Nintendo 64 era and this is a comparison that isn't really fair for a couple of reasons. First off, Banjo Kazooie arguably does a lot of things better than Mario 64. It has bigger worlds, more stuff going on and looks better than Mario. I don't want to go too much into detail about Banjo here, since this is a video about Mario, the only reason I bring a comparison between Mario 64 and Kasui up here is to point out how unfair comparing these two is. First, a game like Banjo couldn't exist without all the work Mario 64 did before. Kasui uses the same camera which Mario 64 invented. It features a similar movement system, it borrows the hub world and it borrows heavily in the level design as well. Frozen Frenzy Peak, for example, is an ice stage that is built in a circle around a gigantic snowman. It's the exact same idea as Snowman. Land. Benji and Kasui are able to fly around in the levels, something also first seen in Mario and the list goes on and on. Benji is only able to be such an amazing game because it was able to borrow ideas from Mario. The second reason why the comparison is unfair is for a reason often forgotten. Benji Kasui was built for the Nintendo 64. Mario 64 was not. Mario 64 was developed alongside the Nintendo 64, which means that for a pretty significant part of the development of the game, the team had no clue how powerful the Nintendo 64 would turn out to be and what would be possible on this console. Basically, they had to play it safe, since there was a significant chance that a lot of their ideas wouldn't run on the 64. So the Nintendo 64 turned out to be significantly more powerful than what they aimed for, but they had no way of knowing this beforehand, and I can only imagine what a nightmare it must have been to optimize the game for the Nintendo 64 at the same time as the Nintendo 64 was still in development. It is incredible to me that they even managed to make a worthy Mario sequel in this development environment. And it's even more baffling to think about how much they were able to revolutionize the gaming world with this game, even under really tough limitations. Tiny Huge Island is the last first floor level Mario has to master before he's finally allowed to enter the attic. This stage features a unique gimmick. Whenever Mario enters a pipe, the stage changes its size. It's either tiny or huge. The variation the team was able to create with the different levels is really impressive, even by today's standards. Almost every level features a unique layout or gimmick. There is a mountain that needs to be climbed and a mountain that needs to be descended. There is a stage where the water level shifts and an evil version of the hub world. There is a main and there are levels built in a circle around a single point of interest. The team probably wasn't able to create a lot of variation in the game by creating tons and tons of different obstacles and level themed enemies. And so they went for something different and really clever. They made the levels, their layouts and the gimmicks they feature extremely unique. The eye enemies appear in a lot of levels and so do moving platforms and red coins. Yet still, playing through Hazy Maze Cave is a completely different experience than playing Big Boo's Mansion because one stage is a gigantic toxic maze cave and the other one a dark and spooky mansion. The variety they achieved with the different levels is astounding and is one of the greatest strengths of Mario 64. With that being said, there are only two levels left, TikTok Clock and Rainbow Road. Sadly, these two levels are in my opinion the worst two in the game, especially TikTok Clock has tons of problems. That is a real pity because I love the concept of TikTok Clock. I love the idea of platforming through a gigantic clock and that the speed at which all the mechanics move can be manipulated by entering the clock at different times. I love the concept so much as a matter of fact that since Mario 64 I always wished for Nintendo to give this concept another try in one of their Mario games. A wish which sadly hasn't come true yet, but it is also understandable to some degree because 
boy does TikTok clock have problems. I already talked a little bit about the problems of Mario 64's camera and that precise platforming doesn't work too well with Mario's otherwise brilliant movement. But these problems become really big in Rainbow Road and TikTok clock. So first the camera doesn't work in TikTok clock. Period. But not in a way like the camera is really dated throughout the rest of the game. The camera simply almost never is behind Mario in TikTok clock and this is unacceptable. Not only by today's standards but also by 1996 standards. Mainly because throughout the rest of the game the camera does a way way better job. But that's just the beginning of the problems. I talked about how Mario 64 sometimes expects the player to replay certain parts over and over again. Throughout the rest of the game this is notable as well, but these parts are spread out far over the game and there are less stars that work this way than one might think, but TikTok clock only works this way. The first star is climb a part of the clock. The second one is climb the same part plus a little bit. Then climb the same part plus even more and so on. With only one and a half exceptions, the level expects you to do the same platforming challenges over and over again. But sadly, things become even worse. The platforming simply doesn't work with the way Mario's movement is programmed. There are tons of platforms that require Mario to platform on top of them really fast, but are smaller than his turning radius. Seriously, it's not possible to turn around on these platforms because they're simply smaller than the space required to turn around. And there is not just one of these platforms, almost every single one in the stage is too small. This combined with the fact that the camera doesn't work here and that Mario is supposed to replay the same part over and over again leads to a highly frustrating level design disaster, even though the concept of the stage is brilliant in my opinion. Rainbow Road suffers from similar problems. Both stages are suddenly really difficult platforming challenges instead of open worlds to explore. But the thing is that they aren't difficult because they're designed in a tricky but fair way. They're difficult because half of the time Mario just falls off the platform when I want him to turn around. Originally I wanted to conclude here by saying that Mario's movement and the camera were designed to explore vast open worlds, not to do platforming challenges and that these stages don't work because of this. But after some thinking I don't think that's the whole truth. because. The the Bowser levels work brilliantly, even though they're built in a similar way than TikTok Clock or Rainbow Ride. So I replayed the last two levels and Bowser's levels over and over again and tried to find out what was going on there. And I think I found the answer. The level design is where platforming often doesn't work, not Mario's movement. Mario's movement was designed for wide open spaces and for a camera that is either directly behind him or directly to his side. Mario needs a lot of space to turn around and navigate in order for his movement to really shine. And the Bowser levels are designed in a way that gives these systems time to shine, but TikTok Clock and Rainbow Ride are built in the complete opposite way. The Bowser platforming parts aren't set in a castle, but into a wide empty space. Because of this the camera is able to rotate everywhere and doesn't get stuck. And suddenly the camera is excellent, a little bit outdated by today's standard, but still completely functional even today. TikTok Clock is built inside an enclosed environment. It's basically a cylinder and no matter where Mario stands the camera is never able to be behind him, because behind him is all always a wall and then the camera permanently moves on its own which changes the right inputs midway through a jump. In the Bowser stages the platforms are way bigger than in Rainbow Ride or TikTok Clock. This makes it possible to turn around on top of them and to adjust Mario's position. But it gets even better because whenever Mario is supposed to change the direction into which he's running the levels give him a huge wide arc to do so. Rainbow Road and TikTok Clock literally feature platforms where it is impossible to turn around. If Mario stands on the center of this platform and wants to change the direction he faces, he falls down. Period. I have no idea how something like this can make it into a final game. Or I actually do have a theory, but more on this in a second. TikTok Clock could have been such an excellent stage with only a few tweaks, but as it stands now it's a complete mess and a fight against the game's systems instead of a challenge where mastery over the systems is rewarded. So how to fix TikTok Clock? First make the platforms larger. Second have Mario start in the middle of the clock and put some stars below him and some stars above him. So instead of always climbing the clock, the challenge would be to make your way up for one half and down for the other half of the stars. And third, Mr. Miyamoto, tear down this wall. There is no reason why there has to be a static wall at the side of the stage. Either remove it completely or make the space between the platforms and the wall wider, exactly as wide as required so that the camera doesn't get stuck anymore. And suddenly this mess of a stage probably becomes a real highlight of the game. One way to understand the job of a level designer is to design the environments of a game in such a way that the strengths of the system in place have a lot of time to shine and the weaknesses are hidden. 
If we want to go by this definition, then TikTok Clock is probably one of the worst designed levels in any serious game ever. It is designed in a way that all the weaknesses of Mario's camera and movement have time to shine, and the moments of utter brilliance the systems definitely have are made completely unachievable. There are many areas in the game that shouldn't be in the final version of the game in the way they currently are. The pyramid, the inner of the volcano and the eye glue simply play into all the weaknesses of the system. Instead of this, the game should have more open areas to explore, like Bob on Battlefield, Snow Man's Land or Wom's Fortress where the movement shows its brilliance and the camera is able to support this. Whenever I read a discussion about Mario 64, there are always two opinions about Mario's movement. Two thirds of the people absolutely love it and think it's one of the best movement systems ever made, and the other third finds the game almost unplayable because turning around as Mario plays like playing as a drunk Monty Mole tank. The thing is, both of these opinions are right in my opinion, because both is true for the game. It is the job of the level designers to craft environments where the second argument doesn't appear and the first one is able to shine, and Mario 64 is sadly a little bit sloppy in this regard. There is a really interesting Miyamoto interview, upon which I stumbled when doing the research for this video. He was asked the following. Whether we are talking about Mario's movement or the camera, I can see that working in 3D certainly has its own challenges. How about the aspect of game design? And Miyamoto answered, Well, I don't think our game design process differed that much here compared with our 2D games. We spent about half our time and energy designing the basic systems that we talked about. As for the courses and enemies, those actually came at the very end. They were done in a single burst of energy, just thrown together, almost. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, I believe this is exactly what happened. They crafted a brilliant and revolutionary camera system and one of the best movement systems ever built, even by today's standards. And then they didn't do it justice. They probably ran out of time. I still think Mario 64 is a brilliant game and it is still a ton of fun to play even 21 years after its initial release. But whenever I play the final Bowser level, which in my opinion is designed really clever, I can't help but to see how much more potential Mario 64 had if they only had a little bit more time to fix the areas where their movement and camera had troubles. Anyway, once Mario made it through the final level, there is only one last Bowser boss fight left and the credits roll. The credits actually tell us something really interesting about the game as well. The team was surprisingly small, maybe 20 core developers, if we assume that all of them appear during the credits. And then the game ends and Mario finally gets his delicious cake. Thank you, Mario. We have to do something special for you. Listen, everybody. Let's bake a delicious cake for Mario. Hooray! Super Mario 64 is a masterpiece. It is probably among the 10 most important video games ever made. It showed the whole industry how 3D navigation could work and it is still a lot of fun to play today. This kind of shows how incredibly well Miyamoto and his team nailed the movement and the camera because the game in its current state is a masterpiece, even though there is still much room for improvement. So that's Super Mario 64 in a nutshell. This video turned out to be way longer than I intended it to be, so thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed watching it. If you enjoyed watching it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and maybe you feel especially 1969 today and want to hit the subscribe button as well. I hope that you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye.